kind of obsessed with uh, the TV schedule lately, and I want to read some of the, uh, and I noticed a disturbing theme. I want to read some of the titles, uh, and this is just in the last year or so. You, Me, and the Apocalypse, The Last Man on Earth, The Last Ship, The Strain, Z Nation, Zombie Nation, Falling Skies, Aftermath, The Walking Dead, Fear the Walking Dead, and, and the new show, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I'm thinking it's about Donald Trump's campaign, um, No Tomorrow. <laughs> so, best of all, I was able to find this list on a website called postapocalypticmedia.com. So, if you want, you can go and literally immerse yourself in this media 24-7. And... Um, and this, this website shows you how to do that. It's got lists of films and television and video games. And you can literally live in this world 24-7. Um, but so there's, there's this whole movement of self-help instructors, Tony Robbins. You guys all heard of Tony Robbins. Um, a lot of self-help instructors who, well, let's try it actually. Um, so everybody close your eyes. And Phil, uh, uh, Ronan had us close, close our eyes earlier, so we're not going to sleep. But close your eyes and now visualize what you want your world to look like. You have five seconds. Three, two, one, stop. Okay, open your eyes. And I just want a couple hands. Like, what did you think? What did you visualize? Anybody? Yes. No cars. No cars. No freeways. No freeways. No freeways. If we got rid of our freeways, how much new park space and open space would we have? I mean, just think of that. And think about the people who live along the freeways who are actually getting asthma because of, of the pollution. Now would have one of the best real estate areas in the world. Um, what else? Yes, ma'am. All of the lawns turn into food sources. The lawns turn into food sources. So, so with the drought, the whole state has really been looking at uh, what do we do about all these really thirsty lawns where we pour a lot of our, our water. And um, in Los Angeles, in, in the Metropolitan Water District is the body that oversees the water policy for all of Southern California. They funded, and my boss was on the board and we were a big part of this, $350 million to rip out lawns across Southern California. And when we did that, we weren't totally thinking, unfortunately, of the overall impact. Uh, and there's this little, this little uh, company called Ter Terminators who came in, ripped out the lawns, and put down rocks. And we did this massive transformation of Southern California in a really short time, and now we got a bunch of rocks out there. And as things get hotter, that's going to um, put more heat island impacts into the world. And so my boss just introduced a motion to um, if you're going to get a rebate for turf removal, if you've got to do a watershed approach or grow food um, to get the rebate. So a watershed approach creates healthy soil. It captures rainwater. Uh, you grow native plants. So the more native plants you plant, you can uh, create healthy pollinators. Um, you know, the bees and the butterflies are struggling. So if you consciously think about it, we can be not just sustainable, like Philip said, but regenerative. We can actually actively create a better planet. Because sustainability is about kind of maintaining where we are, but re regeneration is making it better actively. Think about it. What else? Yes, sir. Um, well, I have a very specific uh, utopia. And there's a place very close to where you grow up. It's called Cordes Junction. And Paolo Soleri began building Arcosanti. Mm -hmm. And it would be a city without cars. Mm -hmm. and, and to uh, come back to John, it, the predecessor conference, in a sense, to the one last year, was in 1972, the alternative to the conference. And Paolo Soleri came at that point. And um, we all became very much acquainted with this, with this hope and this dream. And it's doable. It's doable. Um, it, a world without automobiles is to a world, a world with gardens instead of uh, zombies and all of that kind of thing it is possible. Yeah, if, you, if you have good gardens, they're not going to want to eat your brains. Just think about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so there's a whole movement of, of self-help instructors and life coaches, Tony Robbins and the like, who tell you to visualize what, your li- what you want your life to be really specifically down to the mailbox if you're thinking about your house. And um, because they believe, and I concur, and I believe this conference is about, you can actually manifest your future. So, you know, if you've been watching any of those TV shows or the presidential campaign, we're actually doing it. We're creating the apocalyptic world that, that we've been visualizing. If, if you're paying attention to the, the climate impacts that are happening across the world, the extreme storm events are getting worse and worse and people are getting flooded. And, um, you know, like all of South Carolina was flooded uh, a couple months ago. And when my boss first, it, my boss is LA City Council member, Paul Koretz. Uh, when he first started talking about climate change a couple of years ago when I started working for him, he, we would look and there'd be like a climate event in the last month and then in the last two weeks. And now literally it's happening every single day. Every day I'll look and there is something happening today. Somebody right now is struggling underwater with a flood. And we're, you know, we're going to get a half an inch of rain here in Southern California today, which is a lot of rain. So we're creating it. And the worst part is it's, it hasn't been that abrupt. It's been like really quietly creeping up on us. And there's the, the metaphor of the, the frog in the boiling water analogy, which I think somebody just proved. So don't put any stock in this. But we're supposedly, if you drop a frog in a boiling pot of water, he's going to jump right out. But if you put him in, in a cold pot of water and you slowly turn up the heat, you can boil it. And that's what's been happening to us because slowly, noticeably, things have been getting worse and worse. And we're finally at the point where I think we've, we're reaching the tipping point where everybody's going, oh shit, now what? And, and that's what the Pando conference, I think, really addressed is we went through these, these different tracks of um, listening to the problems that are happening. And then the very last track was, now what? Now what do we do? So let's go the other direction. I've got a few uh, case studies we can look at and starting with my own I'm actually a screenwriter which is why uh, today is, is particularly interesting um, for me if you told me 10 years ago I'd be wearing a suit every day instead of flip-flops at a coffee shop I, I would have thought you were crazy uh, and, and I would I think I was as crazy as like a you know reality show host being a presidential candidate <laughs> um, but here's what I feel. Here's what I visualized back in northern Arizona, where I grew up. Uh, I spent most of my days out in the woods with the big ponderosa pine trees. Um, you know, smelling the pine trees. You literally smell the pine trees, and I miss that smell. Um, and you can hear hear the stellar jays. These blue blue jays with with black heads. They look sort of like cardinals, scolding you as you walk through the forest. And you hear the crunch uh, of the pine needles. And um, I feel the wind and the sun on my skin. And that's where I, where I really learned where nature works. And nature works perfectly. Like there is no waste in, in nature. There is no pollution in nature. Nature is this perfect system. And biomimicry is starting to come, come forward. It's been around for a long time, but it's starting to really come forward as a concept. Like maybe nature has it right. Maybe mankind trying to control nature isn't the thing. Maybe we need to mimic nature and figure out what nature does and incorporate it into how we develop our world. So I had a friend whose dad had a water ski boat and we would take it up to Lake Powell, which is this giant lake in, in Grand Canyon. They, uh, they dammed up one of the most gorgeous canyons in the, in, in the Grand Canyon called Glen Canyon. And, um, and they turned it into a gorgeous lake I didn't know what the, the canyon had been there at the time. But, um, you know, we'd be up there and you'd be in the sun and water skiing and the wind in your, and the spray in your face. But I'd look up and there on the horizon was this gigantic coal plant with these big three pipes spewing smoke out. And I would look at it and we'd sit there at night and you see the flashing lights. And you see, if, if you're up there at night, you see all the stars in the world, like the whole Milky Way, it's so dark up there. But then you see the flashing lights of the coal plant. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna take down that coal plant someday. 
and I never thought I would get the chance. But um, cut to 2008, I graduated from UCLA with a master's in screenwriting and abruptly lost my job in the recession. And I started, uh, as I was writing screenplays, I kept writing screenplays about saving the world, saving the world, saving the world, saving the world. And I was like, maybe I need to do something about this. Because <laughs> I was always thinking that people were addressing climate change. Somebody was doing something about it. And I'm like, somebody's doing something about it. I don't have to do anything. I can, I can write my screenplays. And finally it occurred to me, no. Like, if you want to do something about climate change, if you want to keep the planet habitable, you got to get involved. And it's not just me, but everybody needs to get involved. This is really all hands on deck. This is our one habitable planet that we know about, that we can reach. We're not going to Mars. Elon Musk is like trying to, you know, keep the planet habitable, but he's also, you know, planning to go to Mars if we can't do it. Um, so, so I realized I just finally needed to go do the work. And I started taking some sustainability classes at, at UCLA. And I volunteered on the, the state plastic bag ban, which if you're gonna vote next in two weeks, uh, the vote is yes on 67 and no on 65. Yes on 67, no on 65. Um, and I was working on the state, pla the state plastic bag ban. It was voted down in 2010 because seven senators took 3,900 bucks a piece from the, the plastics industry. Like how much is your ocean worth to you? How much your river is worth to you? How much your flora and fauna worth to you? 3,900 bucks. I'm like, at least get a car out of it, right? Uh, so I was pissed and I said, I'm gonna go back to Los Angeles and I'm gonna make the plastic bag ban happen there. And I took the next two years and I've been involved in the, the neighborhood council system. There's 95 neighborhood councils in Los Angeles. And I figured there's 15 city council member districts. I work for a council member. Uh, which represents 250,000 people. Each one of those is broken into like five neighborhood councils. And I figured if I got three neighborhood councils to support a plastic bag ban, the council member would have to vote for it, right? So I thought it was gonna be easier than it was. But I spent two years going to all these meetings, talking to all these neighborhood councils into supporting it, and I would bring letters of support to um, the council member's office. And I kept bringing more, I kept bringing more, I kept bringing more. And finally, they're like, we need to get a restraining order on you or hire you. And I literally created my own job. I said, what do you want me to do? They said, we want you to just keep doing what you're doing. And that's been my job description, which, you know, I'll own that. Okay, uh, I'll keep it up. And the lucky thing is I got to, to see the plastic bag ban through. I got to see through the process. I got to work through the committees. I got to figure out the exact thing we needed to say to combat the big plastics industry that we were fighting. Because literally there is so much money being spent to create the dystopia that you see that that's why we need everybody on board because there's so much money being spent against us by the oil and gas industry, by the American Chemistry Council, by big plastics, uh, by Monsanto and all those, the GMO folks. Like, GMOs are terrible. They're, for one purpose is to sell more pesticide and herbicide. There's all this like smoke and mirrors, it's about selling pesticide. So, uh, so we got to, uh, oh, as we're fighting the, the special interests, they kept talking about the health impacts of reusable bags. You know, oh, reusable bags are, you know, scary and gross and blah, blah, blah and all these so-called studies, which actually aren't studies, uh, paid for by the American Chemistry Council. We're talking about the health impacts. And so it occurred to me, I'm like, why don't we talk about the health impacts of plastic bags? It's like 25 babies a year in the United States and probably more across the world suffocate in plastic bags. Not one person has ever died from a reusable bag. And the minute we brought that up, done. We finished it and the largest city in the nation to institute a plastic bag ban went into effect uh, two years ago. So we're saving billions of plastic bags from going into the ocean, into the rivers, and it's really cleaned up our, our neighborhoods too. So it's, it's creating, instead of dystopia, suddenly we're making things better. And the thing I love about the plastic bag issue is every single time somebody goes to the supermarket, they have to think of me. They don't know they're thinking of me, but I know they're thinking of me because they have to think about their reusable bag. And they have to think about 
I'm carrying this bag because I want to make things better and I want to make Los Angeles better. And so it's helping people dream of a good future every time they go to the grocery store, every time they have to pay 10 cents because they forgot it. And so collectively, the city is dreaming of a better place or they're cursing me, but, but mostly they're thinking of a better place, which is great because the city of Los Angeles is so well known for its freeways and its smog and its conspicuous consumption and, you know, Rodeo Drive. But now we're starting to be known for our mountain lion. We have a mountain lion that lives in the middle of an urban area of 10 million people. And he's like, yeah, that's where I live. You know? And we do our best to protect him. Like, at the day that something happens to him is, is I'm horrified. But we've actively created, and I got to be part of this, wildlife corridors through the Hollywood Hills so that we could get P-22, that's not mine, um, out of Griffith Park when he gets to mating age, which he's at right now, so he can go meet P-23 and make P-24. You know, like, because he's by himself, and we don't want that so much. Um, but it's also creating wildlife corridors for all the other animals to get around. And we're trying to show that you can actually coexist with human beings and, what, and a predator. The New York Times had this big article about LA is okay with this really potentially dangerous predator living right in the middle of it. And we are, we're protected. Um, and the other thing that P22 has inspired is he ate some coyotes who had eaten some rodents that had rodenticides in them. And rodenticides, there are different generations of rodenticides, uh, but they've been created to kill a rodent in such a way slowly so that the rodent will crawl away instead of like the mouse trap thing where the, the mouse dies instantly and you have to deal with it. This way the rodents crawl away and die in a hole and human beings don't have to deal with the mess that they made. And that's something to always remember. Rodenticides are trying to build a better mouse, mouse trap by not making us face the death, the destruction that we're causing. Uh, so what a rodenticide does is it slows down the rodent, and if you're a predator, if you're a hawk, or if you're a P22, or if you're a, a coyote, you're gonna go for that little slow mouse instead of the faster mouse. And so they eat them. Most of the bobcats in the state, 98% have rodenticide. And that causes mange, and it slows them down, and these are our beautiful big predators in, in California. California is one of the 35 floristic bio biodiversity provinces in the whole world. That means we have a very rich biodiversity system, and we have to do what we can to protect it, including our big predators. So, um, so the biggest lesson that I've learned, oh, this is the best part. You know, I got to help us start moving away from uh, coal power. And we closed down one of the turbines at the Navajo Generating Station at Lake Powell, and I was a big part of that. So the little eight-year-old who was sitting there with his water ski saying, I want to close that down, I did. And that was awesome. So, yeah, there's a long way to go. There's still two more. We couldn't do anything about the other two because we have partners in the plant, but we got one. Um, and we need your help to get the other two. So go do it. Um, but the biggest lesson I've learned is I can't, I really can't do it on my own. And, and I, um, it was a big partnership into the plastic bag band. Heal the Bay was a big part of it, Surf Rider Foundation. Um, a lot of people were working on it. And uh, after I accomplished the plastic bag band, I realized I didn't want to spend two years going to the neighborhood councils. So I went out and created a neighborhood council sustainability alliance with the goal of having a sustainability committee on each of the 95 neighborhood councils across Los Angeles. So then, if I'm bringing forward uh, an environmental policy, I can just go to the chair of the, the sustainability committee and we can start to get support from every neighborhood council really quickly because we really need to go as quickly as possible. And so that, it took a couple of tries to get it right. We got the right person in charge of it. And now they're being really effective and they're, uh, they're working on getting Los Angeles to move to 100% renewable power sooner than the Department of Water Power wants to. 
And that's going to be a really big deal. And we're going to get as many neighborhood councils as we can on board. So the whole city is saying, we want 100% renewable power. We want clean power. We want to get away from, from polluting fossil fuels. So, so the biggest thing to do is keep engaging new constituencies, engaging people who are out there who are like, I would like to do something. I don't know what to do. So, so that was one of the things that we've done. Uh, for another instance of or organizing, I came out to the, the Panda Populist Conference. And we sat through, uh, you know, these amazing, uh, it was an amazing conference. It really, a lot of information, a lot of indigenous culture, um, which I wanted to sit through that. And I sat through, I wanted to sit through Phillips track. And uh, there was a political collapse track that I was in. Um, and at the end session, they said, okay, we've sat through all of this. What do you want to do? And some of the professors said, let's write a white paper. <laughs> and the three activists in the room, including me, sort of put our heads down on the table. <laughs> and, you know, it, we're at a, an academic institution. It's very important to do all the, the research and everything. But after this amazing conference, I was lit up and I wanted to do something and I wanted something to come out of this that was concrete, on the ground, making a difference. And so I pitched to Pando and to the executive team that uh, why don't we actively go out and build eco-villages in each part of LA that we can then model and scale and spread out across the country where you build an eco-village, you fill it up with you know, young people, maybe right out of college, who need job training, and you have them go teach their neighborhoods how to do energy efficiency and water conservation. And so they're learning a job skill that they can then spread and spread and spread and spread and spread. Well, it takes a lot of money to build an eco village in Los Angeles. Um, so we're like, that's a good idea. We would love to do it, but we need to start smaller because we don't have the funds. And if any of you are billionaires and want to fund it, we were happy to take the money. Um, but so what we did do is we started creating what are called Pando Hubs, which are connecting the organizations across LA County, and, and that includes Claremont, uh, together as a network, because there's all these different groups who are doing really great work, but they're kind of working in silos. And a lot of it happens because of fundraising and, and they're going for the same grants and all that stuff. But you can still interconnect and work together and mutually support each other on the things that you can support each other on. And so that's what we're after. So you've got, we're getting the folks who are already doing great things and we're connecting them with folks who want to do great things. So the very first Pando Hub was this little group called the Natural Ivy Foundation. And it's a homeless shelter and they wanted to be the very first homeless, uh, first green homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. And so we took the brain trust from and the, the conference, because there's a lot of really smart people, and we aimed it at something concrete, literally concrete. There's concrete in the backyard of the Natural Ivy Foundation, which we ripped out, and we put in an edible garden at, at a homeless shelter. So now, there's nothing more therapeutic than working in the soil. So we've got formerly homeless people working in the soil. That helps them ther therapeutically. Throwing their own food, that helps in, you know, everyone and then we created a gray water system to water it from the laundry room so they're watering their own thing they're not using excess water and it was really it's really been a cool experience so that was the first new pando hub and we're and we're just getting started you know we we're, we're moving across la county and we're gonna best case scenario we move it through uh throughout los uh California and from there on into the world um, and really interconnect everybody and, and get everybody working together until the web becomes this beautiful dome of sustainability and regeneration and, and um, where everybody's working to create the kind of world that we want instead of the kind of world that we've been inheriting. So the next, uh, the next cool thing that we've been working on I've been working with the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance on something called Cool Blocks. And what Cool Blocks are is it's uh, given that we, we haven't been able to pull off the eco-village thing quite yet, 
we're identifying people in each neighborhood and a neighborhood is defined as a bunch of houses facing each other on a block in this, in this instance. Getting one leader on, on the neighborhood to say, I'm going to leave my neighborhood for four months on water conservation, energy efficiency, and waste production. And they invite their neighbors over. They say, I want to build a stronger community. I want to um, reduce our bills, our water bills, our energy bills. I want to have disaster preparedness. You know, constantly we're hearing about the next earthquake that's going to happen. And it could happen right now, but it could happen in 25 years too. So um, it's going to build stronger community. Like how many of you have been to your neighbor's house recently? How many of you have been to all your neighbor's houses? Uh, uh, uh. Good. Love that. Uh, so he is a panda hub right there. And think of it that way. Like the more people you connect with on these issues, the more good and benefits you're going to get. So, so the cool blocks, uh, we were able to launch 14 of them earlier this year, and we had an enemy on the city council that, and, and this is a good uh, uh, best practices, or maybe not best practices, uh, we had an enemy on the, the, the city council who would actively go after us and try to gut whatever sort of budget funding things we were doing. So we hid the cool blocks under a budget item called cool concrete. <laughs> and which is a whole different, you know, had nothing to do with. And we hit it under there. Nobody noticed it. So we pushed through $150,000 to fund these. <laughs> uh, nobody paid attention. And we're just like, and now that it's in there, it'll be in there uh, next year because we don't look at the old stuff. We look at the new stuff. <laughs> so uh, if you have enemies and you do in doing this work, it's okay to work harder and smarter and strategically to get the things done that we need to do because they're spending money to actively support what we're doing. So, and lastly, um, oh, there's two more things. I very much want to build a mobile app that, that is, makes it competitive to go out and do this stuff. So you can gather a team, sort of like the Pokemon Go thing, where you go out and instead of fighting in the, you know, whatever the, the, the little neighborhood thing with the flipping the, you know, um, I did it for a little while too. Uh, I want you to go out and like, somebody says, okay, your challenge is to go put solar panels on your coffee shop. And you accept that challenge and you go build a team and you make it happen. You fund it, you engage the business owner and you do it. And then as you do it, it builds a cool app, uh, online avatar. Maybe they get uh, green points on um, online, Green Stars on, what's the restaurant review site? Yeah, Yelp. You know, green, green Yelp points for doing it. And then interconnect all the different restaurants that are doing this and all the different dry cleaners and all the different, and, and create an online wiki of best practices where if you're a dry cleaner, these are the things you need to do to be sustainable. If you are a, uh, you know, a Chinese restaurant, these are the things you need to do. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, I want to do that. I'm working on that. Not as easy as it looks if you're uh, if you if you work in government. But um, you know, we can't sit around waiting for Congress to do it. We need to do something. We need to make it fun, and we need to engage the youth of of the world. Um, who who you know? People talk about oh, we're worried about the youth with learning about video games and spending so much time online. I feel like you guys are learning the exact things you need to learn interact with people across the world to keep the planet habitable and create this beautiful future that we're that we're creating together so keep doing it don't listen to them keep doing it and we got to figure out a way to to uh, make it all really useful and lastly uh, and then I'll shut up is um, we've all heard the call for a World War II type mobilization to top to fight climate change People keep saying, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. The Democratic Party uh, accepted that as part of their platform in August at the, the Democratic Convention that we would do a World War II type mobilization. And it's the same thing with, with uh, let's write a white paper. I'm like, let's just do it. Like everybody's talking about, it. let's do it. So Pando and, and I and uh, 
we're, we're figuring out, we've got all these amazing people in Los Angeles. We've got the Imagineers, you know, who created Disneyland and who created all the cool new stuff. We've got screenwriters of Tomorrowland. We've got the screenwriters of, you know, all these different brilliant people and brilliant video game designers. One of my best friends is a, a video game designer who's worked on Call of Duty and, and um, kind of a big mucky muck in that world. And he's teaching people how to shoot people. And from first person point of view, so you're like actively teaching people to kill people. And it started to occur to him that maybe he wants to spend his life force working on other things that help improve things. So he's interested in this. And we're calling it uh, hashtag LA Moonshot 2025. And we're gonna see, we're gonna get these folks together and it's not the usual suspects. It's not gonna be the Sierra Club. It's gonna be folks who are out living their lives, their brilliant, amazing, genius life. We're gonna get them together and say, how can we create a Los Angeles that is carbon neutral by 2025? How can we get us off of fossil fuels by 2025? LA Department of Water and Power doesn't wanna do it because it's gonna cost a lot of money, they think. But if we engage the brain trust in dreaming this beautiful future together, and taking out, how do we take out freeways? How do we do that? We don't need them. I mean, the, the problem with cars is they're fun. It's fun to drive. It's just fun. I like to drive. Um, so, but how do you do that? Um, there's something called PRT, personal rapid transit, that, that uh, they're building in certain places around the world that has little pods that would take you places. And it's very Jetsons, but it seems pretty cool and would be fun. And if you're in one of those, you don't have to worry about running into somebody. You can be on your phone or you can be watching a movie or you can do whatever you want. Um, so it's a time saver. But uh, we're going to launch that in January, and it's not going to be like this big press push. It's going to be working together at somebody's home and just visualizing this and figuring out how we do it and what are the really concrete steps we can do to create an amazing future Los Angeles. And the future is that people are moving to the mega cities, and they're going to make the mega cities even more mega. And you can just tell in Los Angeles that the traffic is getting worse and worse. So we've got to figure this out and people are going to come and we're going to have to figure out how to create water, local water supply to capture the rainwater. If we get seven inches of rainwater in a year and we capture it all, we can use it to um, on your lawns and you don't have to import water. Anymore. So that's important. So hashtag LA Moonshot 2025. Look for it on Twitter coming in January. Um, And, you know, I'm still confused sometimes that I'm doing this stuff instead of writing screenplays, but I always figure somebody else is work, working on it, and they weren't, and they aren't. And um, we really need all hands on deck, like I said. So I hope you will join the fight. And I'm not sure where life will take, where, where life will take me from now, but close your eyes and come back to Lake Powell with me for a moment. And imagine Glen Canyon. The gorgeous, stark red, white sandstone desert canyon walls, big blue skies dotted with white fluffy clouds. It's one of the most beautiful areas in the world, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most beautiful areas in the entire Grand Canyon. Uh, Glen Canyon was filled up by Lake Powell and disappeared. But, but imagine it. And then you see that big white dam holding back Lake Powell. I'm going to get rid of that, too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what's the... Well, that's what we're going to do next. We're going to leave a little bit of time for your open questions right now, and then we'll end the session with we've got these sticky pads here, and then we're going to kind of thinking about what pathways, little things that jump into your mind. So think about this so where you refer to Andy talk about our opening. Uh, we're going to give a chance here to ask him some direct questions right now just as a group. Um, and then we'll take kind of the last 10 minutes, I'll put some markers out. And just thoughts that come to your mind, you can write them on the butcher paper, you can put them on the stickies and put them up there. We're thinking, what are our, you know, what are the next steps individually and communally on the path towards political engagement? to help us build this positive future. So we'll give a little chance here for you to just dialogue and ask questions from what you talked about. And we'll take the last 10 minutes or so uh, 
for you to brainstorm on the butcher blog and sticky notes. So what are our next steps? And you can be random thoughts, they can be sentences, they can be whatever you think. We can put some collective intelligence here. And then, uh, then we'll have a short break for our next uh, featured speaker. So questions for Andy. Yes. I'll, I'll wait for okay. You are you are a member of the community, so happy to talk. Okay. Hi. Um, you said that we need to find an alternative water source other than what's already coming from Pasadena Spring. Why doesn't the state of California or even the city of Los Angeles because in desalinator. Uh, so desalination, everybody knows what that is? Anybody who doesn't? Uh, so so the, um, the water system in California kind of goes like this. So this is the Western Sierra, this is the Eastern Sierra, and this is from the Colorado River. Uh, currently, this one, which is what the movie Chinatown is all about, we're not getting any water out of that. The, uh, the Western Sierra last year was terrible. We got a little more snow this year, so it's a little better. But this is imported water that, that comes to us from uh, the Bay Delta. And when you talk to the governor talking about his tunnel plan, that's what he's talking about, he was build tunnels up here, take more water from the Sacramento River. But it won't actually give us more water. They just say it'll make it more reliable. Fortunately, Colorado has had a lot of snowpack, so the Colorado River water has been really propping us up. Um, and um, so that's the, the, where the water system is right now, just to kind of give you an overview. Um, San Diego built a desal plant in Carlsbad to, um, at a cost of a billion dollars, and they're gonna, for that, they're gonna get to 50 million gallons of water a day in the ocean. And compare that to Hyperion Water Treatment Plant in Los Angeles, which throws into the ocean, treats to near drinking water standards and throws into the ocean 275 million gallons of water a day. So uh, what we're working on in LA, because then that's just kind of wasted water and we're putting it into the ocean and it's not completely clean. So what we're working on is using the Hyperion 270 million gallons use it in different ways. It's right next to the airport, so we're gonna use it at the airport. We're looking at connecting, um, one of the last things my boss did before he left the uh, Metropolitan Water District Board, he wanted to change the business model. And the business model is all about imported water. Um, so what we wanted to do is change the business model toward recycled water. And so they're building the largest, and this was a fantastic thing to be a part of too, they're building the largest uh, recycled water treatment system in the South Bay with LA County's uh, water treatment plant. And it's gonna have little juts that go over to what's called the central basin, groundwater basin. It'll filter the water through, and then they'll pump it back up and reuse it, treat it and reuse it. So it's, it's been cleaned once at the treatment plant, it gets cleaned again through the natural way that, that all the way water gets cleaned. And then, um, and it can take, the groundwater basin is so large, it can even take 20 years to come back uh, and get treated and reused. But that's the goal, because uh, there's a few, a few problems with desal. One of them is the, is the cost. The second one is it's very energy intensive. And so if you're using desal to, uh, to create water, you're act actively, because we're still not on, on uh, clean power completely, to using dirty power to create water, and it's sort of a negative feedback loop uh, to make the, the, the climate worse and therefore the drought worse. And you know, so it's a negative feedback loop. And then with uh, with also with desal, we don't know what to do with the brine, which is the salt. Like you pull it out and you put it on the ground, and it makes it makes the soil bad. And if you put it back in the ocean probably doesn't affect it that much, but if everybody starts doing it, it um, you know, you don't want to create a salt in your ocean. All the oceans have a huge uh, health problem too. So that's what really, on your salad. What's that? Put it on your salad. 
throw in your salad. That's what my dad is like, well, you know, get a, get a salt company going. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there, there could be options, but it's, there, there's significant problems with desal, but there, there's a lot of people who believe it's, it's, uh, it's a, a good way to go. We just think that, um, that, and here's, here's the last point, is if you actively build uh, stormwater capture, we're building a system of cisterns. <coughs> uh, throughout Los Angeles, so you can put a cistern under uh, a playground or under a park or under your house. And if you actively start capturing the same stormwater, it's cheaper and um, and then you don't have to move water, you don't have the energy use. And so that's that's where we're going in, in Los Angeles. How do you view political engagement and activism and organization in the current political climate? Does anything change for you? Are there particular points of leverage that uh, you think we should highlight, uh, particular strategies or anything? Define the current political climate <laughs> in your eyes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just so I don't know where you're coming from, because depending on which echo chamber you live in and the internet, it, you know. Definitely. Well, for instance, um, some of the issues that you already mentioned in your talk, so with money. Uh, so looking at the uh, plastics bill, looking at uh, water management, all these things that help. You mentioned big oil and gas, uh, Monsanto and these things, uh, built into the political system to guide decision making. Um, but also, uh, since we're in the sort of uh, presidential race at the moment, uh, also if you I think, uh, I don't know if you want to do any forecasting, but just, just how political engagement might change. Um, take it where you want it. Um, it's sort of an open question. I'm just curious to get your, your take. One of, the, um, one of the reasons I spend so much time on organizing and figuring out how to engage more people is if you fill up the city council chambers with 400 people, city council is going to do what you want. <laughs> like they just are. Um, so if you do that on every important environmental issue, time after time, and we've been better at doing that, then you're gonna get what you want. The minute, the problem with Washington, the problem with the California state legislature is they're so far away, and this is why they will never move it out of Sacramento, because they're so far away that they're, they don't have to hear from you. You know, maybe they'll take one meeting a week back in the district or something or you know do one day of district meetings a month but the more you show up the more you get engaged the more they know that you're watching everything that they do they will start to do, to pay attention to because the problem is the the special interests have these lobbyists who live in sacramento who live in dc who see these people every single day my boss talks about some of the the lobbyists as his friends and i'm just like they're not your friends because <laughs> they're not. Um, you know, they're working for for people who are actively subverting everything, the beautiful future that we're imagining. And um, the only way to combat that is to show up and get to know your council member and get to know your state senator and get to know your assembly member and get to know your congressman and get to know your senator, your big senator, which is really tough to do. Um, that's the only way to do it. And you bring a coalition with you and you gather people up and it's just like you're playing um, World of Warcraft, you know? You gotta get a team and you gotta go do your task. It's the same, that's why I wanna build this, this app. And you go, your task is to go convince the senator to, to vote a certain way. And the bigger team you have, um, and, and you have to build coalitions. This is really important. Uh, if you're, if you're doing any environmental work, you've got to get the business community engaged and on board and showing them how they can make money. And if you can do that, that's going to be half your battle. Um, with, with the plastic bag ban, no on 65, yes on 67. Talking about the plastic bag ban, um, we're talking about here's how you make money with the plastic bag ban. You give 10 cents to the grocers, suddenly they love it and they stop fighting it. You, you show the manufacturers that they can actually make money making reusable bags. That's great. And in doing that, they're making money and we're cleaning up the streets, we're cleaning up the neighborhoods, we're cleaning up the ocean. It's great. So you gotta do that, build coalitions and you know, think outside of the box when you're building the coalition. Not just the businesses, but like, um, 
with the plastic bag situation, Latinos culturally are, ha, have brought the bag, uh, reusable bags to the store. Like it's a cultural thing that people's grandmothers did it and people's grandmothers' grandmothers did it. And once we realized that and started bringing them along also, um, that was a huge part of the, of the statewide problem. Um, so, you know, think outside of the box. Who, who, who can you engage that will help, that will bring value that you haven't thought of before? So, you want to be last still? Sure. I'll remember you last. Um, so, my dad works on, um, like, social investing. Um, and, like, I've been in a couple meetings with, like, the heads of oil companies and stuff where they they want to move in the direction of uh, sustainable um, sustainable power, but they just don't think that they can make money doing it in the long run. Um, so like, how do you convince people to move away from oil and gas and towards other forms of energy? Because the fact of the matter is, it's gonna be a lot easier to move to sustainable energy if we have oil and gas on our side? So that's a really interesting question. The future that we're dreaming of is a future without fossil fuel because fossil fuel at this point technologically cannot be done safely for this planet. So if the fossil fuel industry, if I was the CEO of the fossil fuel industry, and I understood that I'm not in the business of oil and gas, but I'm in the business of energy generation. And you started spending a whole lot of money in designing the future of energy production. You design battery storage, you design solar power, you design wind power. If you get involved in all of that and you spend a whole lot of R&D, and then suddenly Exxon is still the biggest, richest um, power, producer in the world, but it's clean, you know, because I think they're just being short-sighted. It's they're grasping on to, uh, you know, it's right there in the name. It's a fossil uh, and it's a dying industry and they know it and they're fighting like mad to, to, um, to keep their state shareholders happy and keep the profits flowing. But on a dying planet, you don't have any shareholders. So, um, if your industry is actively destroying the planet, you need to, to change your business model. And they have to. It's, it's, they can talk about, oh, we want to be sustainable, but uh, there's no but. Like, get out there and, because Elon Musk is just like single-handedly like, here's, here's electric vehicles, here's battery storage for your home. Like the minute there's solar panels on your roof and battery storage in your house, you don't need most of this stuff. And an electric vehicle in your garage, you're done with fossil fuel. That's it. So they're being really short-sighted for their business. That, that's why. I mean, how do you make those Right. And what, one of the most important uh, aspects of the, of the, climate, uh, the climate movement right now is really bringing in the environmental justice uh, aspects, which is that uh, the traditional environmentalists have been white middle class, upper middle class people, um, and the people who are on the front lines of really all of this stuff, climate change, uh, the, the as things get hotter, people without air conditioning are going to suffer the most. And people who are in uh, tree deserts, if there's no trees in your neighborhood, you're not going to have a cool neighborhood. Um, and these are people who live close to uh, oil and gas uh, production in the neighborhoods in, in Los Angeles. You've got an oil rig like right outside of your window, and you're breathing the toxic fumes. Um, like the health impacts are massive. And so the important conversation with this is you need to look at the holistic view of fossil fuels and are they really cheap? Or if you look at the externalities, 
where you're sending somebody to the hospital and you've got a kid with asthma because he's breathing, um, he's breathing smog from fossil fuels. And like all the externalities are so terrible. Like it costs so much to clean up, uh, 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 you know, if you're fracking and polluting the water table, it costs so much to clean up the water table that all those costs really need to be factored into fossil fuels. And then when you start looking at it that way, actually clean energy is much cheaper because it doesn't have externalities. So, so that's an important conversation. And um, the cool thing is, is uh, the electric vehicles are starting to be cheaper and there's a big push to get uh, like electric uh, bicycles into underprivileged, underserved neighborhoods for free. So you can just cruise around on, on the bikes and, and put good, good bike lanes in. And then the coolest thing that I heard from um, a council member who represents South LA is he said, if you tell some of these mothers up in the big houses and in, in, in sort of the, the, the hills that they wouldn't have to go to the gas station, they could just charge their, their vehicle at home with an electric vehicle because they, they have to go get somebody to help them go to the gas station to keep them safe in that part of the city. And they would suddenly be buying them because they don't have to go to the gas station. Like that was such a really interesting, you know, um, points. So, so externalities is really the big, the big thing about. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and keep me on track, bro. Whenever you want to throw me off, you've got questions. Okay. Well, okay. Just more. drag me off whenever you want. Um, so. My biggest issue is that as a daughter of immigrant parents, my parents don't really trust anything about, you know, changing uh, their view on the environment and, and how to, you know, recycle. And they just don't trust it because they come from a different culture. And I know that you talked a lot about education within your community. Um, but is there, how can I, you know, make my parents trust this and, and convince them that it is good for um, our our planet or at the LA city, LA county, um, because a lot of times they don't even trust neighbors, you know, there's like a, really, they just don't feel like they belong, and how can they change, you know, the neighborhood if they don't feel like they belong to the neighborhood of their city. Right, right, and it's, it's, um, this is a bigger conversation that I'm, that, that's going on with um, this other group that, that I'm involved with, that, uh, who does some work in Africa, and, and and it's uh, it's healing work, and it's um, it's hard to describe just in five seconds here. But but it's healing work that has worked really well in the United States with people who grew up here. And when she started working on it in Africa, suddenly she realized that um, the way that she was approaching it wasn't working culturally because um, she really needed to 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 think about and to to speak to the folks she was working with where they are instead of from where she is, right? So the important word I think that, that you said is community. So so it's not gonna be just be your parents, but probably the community of immigrants from the same area, perhaps. Uh, and so if you can figure out how to kind of crack what's important to them under the context of what where they live and how they live and how they walk through the world, uh, it's if you reduce your energy use, you reduce your power bill. If you reduce your water use, you reduce your water bill. Um, that's always kind of the biggest thing for everybody. It's like, oh, it's cheaper, okay. Um, but you know, every, clean water is important to everybody. If you can live for, what do they say, three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food, um, you gotta have clean water. You gotta have clean food. Um, so you just kind of have to look at them where they are instead of like, as you said, how do I force them? Um, you can't force them. You've you got to step into their skin and understand where they're coming from and then speak to them um, from that point of view. And do you think there's like an effective way the, the city itself to do that? Because I, I can try to as you know, their daughter, but um, I would always think about like a, a way in which you can educate them because educating the children is you know, me, it works on me, but it doesn't really work on them. Like, how can we, I don't know, educate them and enlarge the 
feel like I can do it. But, um. well, and, and one of the things you can do is look around to see if there are people doing the work already um, within your community or maybe in another city. And, and the, the cool thing about what we're trying to do with all these interconnections is create a mentorship situation where, yeah, I don't know how to do this, but somebody does. So I would look for that. So that's the biggest thing. And, and here's a, uh, an example of a cultural uh, disconnect is uh, a lot of immigrants come here that, that I've been hearing about uh, thinking that having a lawn is really a status symbol. Mm -hmm. And so peeling the lawn out of their is, is um, really a disconnect. Like, why would we want to do that? This is, this is shows that we've arrived. This is the American dream. So, we, you know, as part of, we have to reframe the dream too. Hashtag reframe the dream. <laughs> reframe the dream. Hashtag. We're actually going to have to, uh, for the sake of time, wrap that up. Um, but I have one last question. Do you, you want to ask your last question? Okay. You were in line. You mentioned earthquake, and uh, as soon as you said that, I remember a Diablo um, nuclear power plant that is sitting on the fault. And that's something we didn't talk about including the, the nuclear power plant as we shut down. Uh, the nuclear power plant that we do in San Diego right here in the hospital. Mm -hmm. There's some conversations going on to shut the other one down. Or... Yeah, so, so San Onofre, um, I was actually really, really involved in that, uh, like more than I expected to be. Uh, San Onofre uh, nuclear power plant had a little leak uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, that, uh, yeah, well, it's a nuclear power plant, a little leak is a problem. And the further we looked into it, we realized that when they replaced their uh, steam turbine, and I could be wrong on this because it's been a little while since I thought about this, but they replaced a part that uh, they wanted to create more efficient steam. So they put a, a thing with like 100 steam tubes instead of 75, which is what it was designed for, because they were trying to get more efficiency out of it. But in doing so, they, uh, it didn't work. And so suddenly they're using something that, that has leaks and, and, and there's little leaks. And they're like, no, it's fine. It's gonna be fine. It's fine. Don't look over here. Stop looking at me. It's, it's fine. And we kept looking and we started talking about that if there was a massive meltdown, it would affect the port of Los Angeles, which is the largest port in the country and all the goods through the country go through the port of Los Angeles. So, so we got it shut down. And it was a gigantic, amazing effort. Uh, Diablo Canyon has the same team that was working on that is working on Diablo Canyon. So I expect that that will happen. I'm not in, engaged in that one because it's a little too far away. But it's, um, I think they'll get there. But, but we have to, so nuclear power is base load power, which is the same thing as a coal plant. Um, and so you've got to be able to replace the base load power with something else that, that is reliable. And, um, you know, we don't have it. That's why battery storage is essential. So we need to get battery storage really up and running before we can start getting rid of all the, you know, because LA still gets nuclear, 5% of its baseload power from nuclear in that Palo Verde. So, okay. Well, thank you very much, Andy, for being here.